a discussion on the elite test 3 which had the topics from bone mineral metabolism, pediatric endocrinology and the basics of hormonal action. Okay. So moving on to question number 1 is a straight pick from Harrison in the inaugural part or in the initial part of the bone mineral metabolism physiology part. Okay. Which of the following is not true regarding the regulators of bond formation and mineralization? You know, this is a very high yield area. You have to learn so many confusing things and hormones, the transcription factors and their respective effects on various steps of bone formation and metabolism. Okay, let's look at the options. Run X2 is the master transcription factor regulating bone formation. Alkaline phosphatase is a negative regulator of pyrophosphate. Cleidocranial dysplasia is due to inactivating mutation of the Indian hedgehog gene and sclerostin inhibits the WNT signaling in the osteoblast. So these are the four options. Very confusing and very difficult to answer if you are not thorough with the concepts. Okay, now let's look at the basics of the important uh, transcription factors, hormones and their respective actions. Now, first is run X2. What do you mean by RUNX2? You know, RUNX2 is a transcription factor which is considered as the master regulator, master regulator of osteoblast differentiation. Osteoblast differentiation. So obviously, when osteoblasts are increasingly produced, it would result in the osteoid production as well as subsequent mineralization. So RUNX2 is a promoter of bone formation. And how does it promote bone formation? By indirectly activating the bone forming pathways. So the bone forming pathways in the bone, there are so many, but two or three important ones, you just have to remember the name. And of these, the most important one being the WNT signaling. So WNT is the most important bone forming pathway, followed by the Indian hedgehog pathway, fibroblast growth factor receptor pathway and the PTH receptor pathway. So these are, we can say, some of the important 405 bone forming pathways of which the most important being WNT signaling. So RUNX2 activates these pathways and stimulate and cause a differentiation of the mesenchymal stem cells or the multipotent stem cells into osteoprogenitor, pro-osteoblast and finally immature and mature osteoblast. So that is the action of run X2. Now looking at rank ligand. Okay, rank ligand. We have seen about the differentiation of osteoblast. Now what happens to osteoclast? So osteoclast also derives its origin from the hematopoietic stem cell. Okay, from the hematopoietic stem cell. And from that, it is acted upon by certain growth factors and certain agents like the colony monocyte uh, colony stimulating factor and the rank ligand. Okay, so rank ligand is the master regulator of osteoclast differentiation and activation. So RUNX2 was there for osteoblast, rank ligand is there for osteoclast. So from where is osteoclast uh, gets the rank ligand from? So the rank ligand is produced by the osteoblast. So osteoblast has a direct effect on the osteoclast differentiation and survival by two things. One, it produces rank ligand which binds to its rank receptors in the osteoclasts to stimulate their differentiation. This osteoblast can also produce osteoprotegerin, osteoprotegerin to antagonize the effects of rank ligand. So both the stimulator and antagonizing agent of the osteoclast are both produced by the osteoblast. So how this balance tilts determines the net action of the osteoclast. For example, the estrogen hormone, it will bind to the osteoblast to increase osteoprotegerin. Whereas the parathyroid hormone and the vitamin D would stimulate the osteoblast to secrete more of rank ligand. So this will cause a balance in net bond resorption or net bond formation. Okay, so that is the important point regarding uh, 
rank like it and osteoprotegerin we have also seen it is a uh, substance produced from the osteoblast that antagonizes the rank ligand and it reduces the osteoclast differentiation osteoclast differentiation now about wnt signaling and the important factors regulating the wnt signaling now so wnt signaling is the major anabolic bone forming pathway so the receptor for WNT is the LRP56. Okay. So the WNT is the ligand. This LRP56 is the receptor. The core receptor that binds to the LRP56 is what we call as the frizzled. So frizzled is the name given to the core receptor binding to the LRP56. So binding of WNT to that receptor will result in the activation of beta catenin. Beta catenin levels. When it increased in the intracellular compartment, it will go and bind to the nucleus in the corresponding beta catenin binding areas, due to which it will cause an increase in the, you can see the beta catenin, when it is increased, it will cause an elevation in the osteoprotegerin and reduction in the rank ligand. So you can assume that Elevation of osteoprotegerin would suppress the osteoclast and reduction of rank ligand would also suppress the osteoclast would result in a net bone formation. Okay, so this is the major function of beta catenin. So that is about WNT signaling. Now, which is the major regulator of WNT signaling? It is the sclerostin. So sclerostin can compete with the WNT to bind to its receptor LRP56. Okay, so the sclerostin displaces WNT of its binding site, thereby inhibiting the beta catenin action. When the beta catenin is inactivated, what will happen? The osteoclast inhibition is lifted. The osteoclast will have more rank ligand binding to its receptor, causing its stimulation and differentiation and the osteoblast survival is reduced. So sclerostin would increase bone resorption and WNT signaling would increase bone formation. Okay, and apart from sclerostin, another molecule is also there called as the DKK1. So both this sclerostin and DKK1 are produced from osteocytes. So osteocytes are the major contributor of the sclerostin and DKK1. Okay, so what is the function of these osteocytes? Osteocytes are the mechanoreceptors. Mechanoreceptors, whenever there is a trauma or microfracture occurring to the bone, osteocytes through their long canaliculi detects the mechanical stress and they will act accordingly by binding, uh, by uh, stimulating more of sclerostin. It would... Uh, inhibit the WNT signaling. So more of osteoclast will be recruited. Osteoclast will uh, resorb all the damaged bone and then the Renex2 signaling will be activated. Osteoblast will be activated and the new bone will be laid down. So there is always a complex interplay between the pro-anabolic and pro-resorptive factors. So coming to the IHH and uh, PTHRP, we have uh, discussed these are the important bone forming pathways alongside WNT signaling. So their inactivating mutation can result in juvenile osteoporosis. That is obvious because these are the important bone forming pathway. So an inactivating mutation in either the WNT or the IHH or the PTHRP would result in the premature or juvenile osteoporosis. Sclerostin and DKK1, we have already learned, they are both produced by the osteocytes and they inhibit WNT signaling. Okay, WNT signaling. Now, what about PTH, vitamin D and estrogen? We have seen PTH and vitamin D, it binds directly to the osteoblast it via the osteoblast it would increase the rank ligand production and it is via rank ligand that they influence the osteoclast and not by directly binding onto the osteoclast
whereas estrogen can bind to both osteoblast and osteoclast. So it will increase anabolism, it can increase resorption also. Sorry, it can, by binding to the estrogen receptors in the osteoclast, it will reduce the resorption. resorption. So PTH and vitamin D when present in excess would be pro-resorptive, whereas estrogen when find, uh, found in excess, it will be pro-anabolic. So I hope all these points are uh, clear. These are very confusing areas. So please, please make a note of these important factors and their respective function and what all levels. So coming to the answer for our question, the first question, the RUNX2 is the master transcription factor regulating bone formation. That is a true statement. Alkaline phosphatase is a negative regulator of pyrophosphate. You know, when the osteoblast is stimulated, it will lay down the osteoid. Then this osteoid has to be mineralized with the calcium hydroxyapatite crystals. And one of the important factor that inhibits the mineralization is the pyrophosphate. So pyrophosphate is an inhibitor of mineralization. So what is the function of alkaline phosphatase? It will cleave the pyrophosphate. The alkaline phosphate phosphatase would cleave the pyrophosphate, thereby the inhibition on mineralization is lifted. So this is also a true statement. Alkaline phosphatase is a negative regulator of pyrophosphate. So sclerostin inhibits the WNT signaling in the osteoblast. That is a very true statement. So here goes the answer. Cleidocranial dysplasia is due to inactivating mutation. The Indian hedgehog gene is a false statement. IHH inactivating mutation would result in premature or juvenile osteoporosis. Whereas cleidocranial dysplasia is due to inactivating heterozygous mutation in the RUNX2 gene. Okay, run X2 gene. So due to reduced osteoblastic action, you will have abnormalities in the teeth. You will have reduced bone mineral density. And you have a specific finding called as the agenesis or hypoplastic clavicles. So hypoplastic or absent clavicles along with teeth abnormalities and reduced bone mineral density are the classical features of cleidocranial dysplasia, which is an autosomal dominant condition due to heterozygous inactivating mutations in the RUNX2 gene. Okay, so that's about question one. Now moving on to question two. All of the following are true about the hormonal regulation of bone mineral metabolism except. So this is one point we have uh, already touched upon while discussing the previous question. Calcitonin receptors are present in osteoclast to reduce bone resorption. PTH receptors are present on osteoblast but not on osteoclast. Vitamin D receptor activation in osteoclast cause increased bone resorption. And finally, estrogen stimulates bone formation by direct action on its receptor present in both osteoblast and osteoclast. Now, let's look at where are these hormone receptors located and what are their function. So, PTH has their hormone receptors in the osteoblast. And they have two functions to increase osteoprotegerin and increase rank ligand. So what is the net effect on PTH? It would be the balance between osteoprotegerin and rank ligand. So if there is a situation when there is a persistent increase, persistent increase in PTH as in hyperparathyroidism, then rank ligand would predominate over osteoprotegerin. Whereas if there is an intermittent rise in PTH, as when you are giving the recombinant parathyroid hormone or the triparatide, then the osteoprotegerin would score over rank ligand. So obviously in hyperparathyroidism, bone resorption outshines the bone formation. Whereas if you are using it in a pharmacological fashion as in the form of triparatide, the osteoprotegerin would be predominating over rank ligand resulting in net bone formation okay and pth has no receptors on osteoclast no receptor on osteoclast this is important the same applies for vitamin d so vitamin d as well as pth have receptors on the osteoblast and it is indirectly by regulating the levels of osteoprotegerin and rank ligand they influence the action of osteoclast. Okay, now what about calcitonin? Calcitonin has receptors exclusively on the osteoclast. 
and what is a function it has a negative action on osteoclast thereby reducing so the osteoclast has calcitonin receptors and calcitonin binding to those receptor would reduce bone resorption that is why calcitonin has two major uses in clinical practice one is to reduce the calcium levels in hypercalcemia because it reduces the further influx of calcium from the bone to the blood and also it is used in the treatment of postmenopausal osteoporosis so subcutaneous or im formulation is used for management of hypercalcemia whereas nasal calcitonin is preferred for the management of postmenopausal osteoporosis now estrogen we have already discussed it has receptors on both osteoblast and osteoclast whereby it stimulates osteoblast and inhibits osteoclast so the net effect would be bone formation so the answer for this question would be the vitamin d receptor activation in osteoclast cause increased bone resorption that is a false statement it is an indirect action not by the direct binding to the receptors so question number 3 which of the following is not true regarding calcium absorption from the gut active mechanisms contribute to more than 90 percentage active transport occurs in duodenum and proximal jejunum trpv5 is responsible for active calcium transport in the intestine and acid secretion increases calcium absorption from the intestine so these are the four statements so let's have a quick recap on the steps involved in calcium absorption from the gut so the proportion of dietary calcium absorbed this is extremely important when you take 100 mg of calcium in a diet around 25 to 30 percentage only is absorbed so you can safely say only around one third of what you take through your food is being absorbed okay from the gut but in patients who are having a very restricted calcium diet like when you are not taking enough calcium through your diet what will happen your calcitriol will be upregulated and the proportion of calcium absorbed from the gut would increase as much as 50 to 60 percentage in reduced calcium diet or in increased calcitriol action an average diet it would be around 30 percentage now from where is the calcium absorbed in the gut of course it is the duodenum and jejunum duodenum and jejunum this is the same for phosphorus as well okay and what is the mechanism behind calcium absorption you have two types of uh, or two methods with which the calcium is absorbed through the gut wall one is the active and second is the passive okay so passive means it leaks into the cells from the lumen transcellularly or paracell sorry uh, it leaks into the cell through the paracellular paracellular route paracellular means through the gap between the two adjacent enterocytes there is a leakage across the transporter from the lumen to uh, the blood capillaries that is passive and the passive contributes to only 5 to 10 percentage of the overall calcium absorption whereas active is the energy dependent transporter mediator okay energy dependent transportation of calcium regulated by specific transporters okay let's look at those pathways so this calcium absorption from the epical surface to the basolateral surface through the gap junctions between the cells is what we call as the passive transport whereas for active transport you have a specific transporter in the epical surface of the enterocyte called as the trpv6 okay trpv6 so where is trpv5 located trpv5 located in the renal tubules okay renal tubules to be specific in the dct where the calcitriol upregulates the channels here also the calcitriol will upregulate but it is not the trpv5 it is the trpv6 which is present in the gut okay so once the trpv6 gets in the calcium from the lumen to the cell it is bound by another calcium binder called as the calbindin so calbindin will take the calcium across the cell to the 
basolateral surface where the sodium calcium exchanger 1 ncx1 it will exchange the uh, sodium to calcium so that the calcium gets into the capillary present here so this is how the calcium uh, active transport goes in the enterocyte you have three uh, transporters one is the trpb6 then you have the cal binding then you have the ncx1 so this is exactly the same pathway that is happening in the renal tubular reabsorption of calcium also but just the, there's a slight change in terminology but the overall mechanism remains largely the same both are stimulated by calcitriol and indirectly by pth then both the trpvs the calbindin and the ncx is involved in the calcium transport across those two areas okay so what are the factors affecting calcium absorption what are the factors so one is the acid so acid in the stomach would promote calcium reabsorption then second is the lactose in the milk that is why in children uh, the lactose would be degraded by the gut bacteria to lactic acid it would reduce the ph and promote the uh, calcium absorption then of course the drugs like uh, proterbum inhibitors would reduce due to reduction in the acid levels and also the dietary components like the phytates oxalates would reduce the absorption okay phytates and oxalates would reduce acid production and the lactose would improve the uh, absorption of calcium from the diet now what about the calcium preparations okay calcium preparations you have to learn about two or three the one with the highest proportion of elemental calcium is calcium carbonate with around 40 percentage followed by calcium citrate which has 21 percentage then you have the calcium lactate which has 13 percentage then calcium gluconate with 9 percentage etc but remember the highest one is the calcium carbonate and calcium citrate has 21 percentage elemental calcium and calcium citrate is especially useful in patients with echlorhydria peptic ulcer disease etc because it doesn't require or it requires minimal acid support for its reabsorption so in patients with echlorhydria who has uh, been on uh, reduced acid levels or those receiving long-term PPIs, calcium citrate would be the preferred drug. So the question, the answer for the question is TRPV5 is responsible for active calcium transport in intestine. That is a false statement. It is the TRPV6 and the TRPV5 is present in the DCT of the kidney. So next question, a straightforward one, which of the following is not a feature of milk alkali syndrome? Okay, so what do you mean by milk alkali syndrome? So we've learned that in the calcium absorption from the gut, 90% is active and 10% is via passive process. Now look at the individual attributes of these two processes. Now active means energy dependent and it is strictly under the control of uh, calcitriol and indirectly from the PTH. So whenever there is excessive calcium in the diet, the gut local concentration of calcium increases your calcitriol will be down regulated and your trpv6 uh, would also be down regulated so active means if there is excess calcium in the diet there is reduced trpv6 so there is reduced calcium absorption whereas as you have seen the passive there is no checkpoint there is no hormone that is regulating the uh, the calcium intake into the blood via the passive process so what happens if you take very large quantities of calcium like in pharmacological supplements continuously throughout for days weeks or months it would still cause a sizable proportion of calcium to be reabsorbed through the passive process itself even though in normal circumstance, it would contribute to only 10% of calcium reabsorption. But when you take calcium intake, say more than 3 to 4 grams per day, you know, usually you take 3 to 4 grams per day, never with any diet, but with by virtue of your uh, treatment regimens. 
the patients may be on long term calcium carbonate therapy uh, for uh, some reason like uh, as a part of uh, their uh, treatment for hyperparathyroidism or in patients with CKD in such patients what will happen is that long term intake of calcium would cause a build up of calcium in our body due to the excessive passive reabsorption from the intestine so they would have a triad of hypercalcemia renal failure because this calcium would then lead on to hypercalciuria nephrocalcinosis and renal failure and also metabolic alkalosis okay so other features would be this is the important triad the hypercalcemia renal failure and metabolic alkalosis the other features would be hypercalciuria and nephrocalcinosis okay now what is the synonym this milk alkali syndrome is also known as cop burnett syndrome cop burnett syndrome is the other name given for milk alkali syndrome then what are the settings in which uh, you develop milk alkali syndrome what when i have told you when there is excessive calcium carbonate intake in the form of tablets then in a patient uh, who are on uh, antacid therapy you know antacids has a lot of milk of magnesia which was previously used in peptic ulcer treatment and they would have calcium and an alkali base antacid treatment for peptic ulcer disease so these are some of the examples where uh, the patient in the current era can develop a milk alkali x syndrome so the answer is hypocalciuria is not a feature it is hypercalciuria and nephrocalcinosis so question number 5 which of the following accurately describes the autosomal dominant hypophosphatemic rickets okay autosomal dominant hypophosphatemic rickets now let's look at the division of hypophosphatemia and how do you approach the different causes which can lead on to hypophosphatemia so when you suspect a uh, urine phosphorus wasting or the renal loss of phosphorus in the setting of hypophosphatemia always you start with the trp or the tubular reabsorption of phosphate at least 85 to 95 percentage of phosphorus is usually reabsorbed from the kidney and in the setting of hypophosphatemia you expect the renal reabsorption to be even higher so if you get less than 85 percentage of tubular reabsorption of phosphate that means renal phosphorus wasting okay renal phosphorus wasting so once you uh, diagnose urinary phosphorus wasting you will uh, differentiate it based on the pth okay pth pth is increased in the setting of hypophosphatemia in vitamin d related causes you know vitamin d it causes a reabsorption of both calcium as well as phosphorus so vitamin d deficiency or its abnormal action would result in hypophosphatemia hypocalcemia and elevated pth so high pth in hypophosphatemia means it's most likely a vitamin d related cause so it could be vitamin d deficiency vitamin d dependent rickets 1a 1b 2 3 etc okay now let's look at the other end of the spectrum where the pth is usually normal or the pth is not driving the excess phosphorus okay so that is what you call as the fgf 23 dependent or independent cause so hypophosphatemic rickets you can classify them into one vitamin d related causes and second is the fgf23 dependent and independent causes okay so the fgf23 dependent causes that means the phosphorus is low in the setting of normal or elevated fgf23 you have conditions like the x linked hypophosphatemic rickets autosomal dominant hypophosphatemic rickets autosomal recessive hypophosphatemic rickets then you have conditions like the fibrous dysplasia tumor induced osteomalacia etc so these are the five important causes of fgf23 dependent hypophosphatemia x linked hypophosphatemic rickets autosomal dominant form autosomal recessive form fibrous dysplasia 
because fibrous dysplasia lesion can produce excessive FGF23 from the osteocytes. Okay, then you have the tumor induced osteomalacia where the mesenchymal tumor cells are producing excessive FGF23. So these are the five important conditions. And two important FGF23 independent hypophosphatemia also you should know. One is the hereditary hypophosphatemic rickets with hypercalciuria may not be important for neat assess, but definitely, definitely important for INI endocrinology. Then you have something called as the X-linked recessive hypophosphatemic rickets also known as the dense disease so dense disease also we have uh, discussed in detail in one of the elite modules okay dense disease and hhrh are causes for fgf23 independent hypophosphatemia now look at some important points regarding fgf23 so it is produced by osteocytes so every point is important here every point so osteocytes so far we have seen it is producing three things sclerostin then fgf23 then dkk1 okay or the dcop1 that we have seen so sclerostin and dkk1 inhibits the wnt signaling and fgf23 has other significant roles which we will be uh, learning in a short while okay so apart from these three it can also produce osteoprotegerin and rank ligand in a very small proportion majority of osteoprotegerin and rank ligand is produced by the osteoblast but a little bit of uh, rank ligand and opg can be produced by osteocyte as well similarly this fgf23 in smaller amounts can be produced from the osteoblast as well so it is not that FGF23 is exclusively produced by osteocytes. Osteoblasts also contribute to that, but a very little proportion. Likewise, the osteoprotegerin and rank ligand at a smaller amounts can be produced by the osteocytes as well. Okay. Now, what are the important actions of FGF23? There are three important actions. Okay. Three important actions for FGF23. One is it increases phosphorus excretion. There are certain transporters in the proximal tubules of kidney that stimulates phosphorus reabsorption from PCT. They are called sodium phosphate transporters 1A and 1C. Sodium phosphate transporters 1A and 1C are uh, present in the renal tubules. They are inhibited by uh, FGF23. So FGF23 would inhibit those transporters thereby the phosphorus reabsorption is reduced and excretion is increased then it will inhibit the 1 alpha hydroxylase enzyme 1 alpha hydroxylase is inhibited therefore there is reduced calcium triol and thirdly it can stimulate 24 hydroxylation 24 hydroxylation so what does 24 hydroxylation do it would cause inactivation of vitamin D. Inactivation of vitamin D. You know, 24 hydroxylation is the major metabolic pathway mediating the inactivation of vitamin D. Whereas 125 dihydroxy vitamin D is acted upon by 24 hydroxylase to form 24 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And this 25 hydro 24 25 uh, vitamin D is inactive. So this is the major mechanism with which the active form of vitamin D is converted to inactive form of vitamin D. Okay. Now looking at the mechanisms of looking at the mechanisms of various forms of hypophosphatemic rickets. So XLH is due to inactivating mutation of the FEX gene. Okay, FEX gene. So this FEX gene would cause the defective sensing of phosphorus by the osteocytes, which lead to increased FGF23. So inactivating mutation of FEX gene would result in elevated FGF23. And this FGF23 would drive excessive phosphorus out of the body, resulting in hypophosphatemia. Then you have autosomal dominant hypophosphatemic rickets, where there is a mutation in the FGF23 gene. Okay, there is mutation in the FGF23 gene, which is an activating mutation, 
and it doesn't cause increased production of FGF23, but rather this activating mutation would render this FGF23 molecule less susceptible to the cleavage. Usually this is cleaved by certain proteases called the furins, but the mutation would render them immune to the cleavage by the usual proteases. So this activating mutation would result in the reduced cleavage and destruction of FGF23, thereby effectively causing an elevated FGF23 action. So autosomal recessive hypophosphatemic records, you need not learn the mutations and all, just learn two important mutations, ENPP and DMP1. Ectonucleotide pyrophosphatase gene and the dendrin matrix protein 1 gene. These two would result in the uh, AR, autosomal recessive hypophosphatemic records. These will also potentiate the FGF23 activity. Then McCune Albright syndrome. McCune Albright syndrome, as you know, fibrous dysplasia is the cardinal board manifestation. And this fibrous dysplasia, the dysplastic osteocytes, would produce excessive FGF23. And we have learned one more condition, which is not a genetic condition, but an acquired, uh, acquired condition occurring later in life, which is the tumor-induced osteomalacia, where the mesenchymal tumors would produce FGF23 as a paraneoplastic manifestation and would present with adult onset hypophosphatemia and osteomalacia. Okay. So that is all regarding FGF23. This is an extremely high yield area and can often be confusing when they ask about which of the following is true or false regarding FGF23. Okay. So apart from these three actions, one previous neat SS question was like this. FGF23 can also directly inhibit the PTH levels. It can directly inhibit the PTH levels, PTH secretion from the parathyroid gland. So that was also one of the important points. Okay. So... The correct description for the autosomal dominant hypophosphatemic rickets is the activating FGF23 mutation. Okay. So, FEX gene inactivating mutation is seen in XLH. So, inactivating ENPP mutation is seen in ARHR. And GAL NT3 mutation inactivation is seen in something called as a tumoral calcinosis. Tumoral calcinosis. So what do you mean by tumoral calcinosis? In this condition, there is reduced FGF23. Reduced FGF23. This gallon T3 uh, is an enzyme that protects FGF23 from its destruction. Okay, so it protects FGF23 from its destruction. When gallon T3 is not there, it becomes, the FGF23 becomes increasingly susceptible for cleavage. Thereby, the active FGF23 levels plummet in circulation. So reduced FGF23 means phosphorus excretion is reduced and there is increased phosphate. Okay, increased phosphate and there will be increased calcium phosphorus product leading to calcium hydroxy appetite deposition around the joints. Okay, so it is the reduction in the FGF23 that is driving the uh, phosphorus retention in the body the calcium hydroxy appetite and the amorphous calcium crystals which is being deposited around the joint which is what you call as tumoral calcinosis. So it is due to either inactivating gal nt 3 mutation or inactivating FGF23 mutation. So activating FGF23 mutation is what you call as uh, uh, autosomal dominant hypophosphatemic rickets whereas the inactivating FGF23 mutation would result in tumoral calcinosis.